Okay, we're back. We're live. Uh, it's the one o'clock block with Michael Davis, who joins us from uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, Michael Davis um, has plenty of experience and time on the ground in Hong Kong, and so he can certainly discuss with us how the bear is bearing down on Hong Kong these days. And that's a reference not to the Russian bear, but to the Chinese bear. <laughs> welcome welcome back to the show, Michael. It might be a dragon, Jay, but we'll see. Okay, I should have used that instead. But isn't it true that, you know, Xi Jinping is bearing down in Hong Kong. He's getting worse than before. He's being meaner, more repressive, oppressive than he has in the past. We're at some inflection point right now, aren't we? Yeah, it's the, the regime is doing this across the board. So it's put pressure on universities in China. It's, of course, locked up a million or more Uyghur people in Xinjiang. Uh, it's harassing the Tibetans. Uh, so this is all by the PRC playbook. Uh, if we've had periods of relative calm in the past, it's because perhaps the leaders in China weren't as determined as this one. He fears the Communist Party will lose power if he doesn't uh, use power. And uh, that's what he's doing. And in the case of Hong Kong, of course, the more he puts pressure on this open society, the more they push back. They say that's Newton's law, you know, that pressure in one direction gets resistance. Uh, and that's what we've been seeing in Hong Kong. And it's kind of wrongheaded, we all know that. Uh, and he's basically co-opted the Hong Kong government and the Hong Kong police to do his biddings. It's interesting now with his recent proposal of a national security law, which he wants to apply directly in Hong Kong, He's gone around and made all these corporate elites uh, swear their allegiance to it and, and praise him for proposing it. So he's coerced uh, a kind of a support among the pro-establishment elite in Hong Kong. And, and this is stunning because these people, uh, even though they're pro-establishment, would have been horrified if 20 years ago China had declared it's going to directly apply its national security laws in Hong Kong, they, they would have all gasped. But now, of course, they, they are all in power and they want to stay there. And so they, they do uh, what he says. The corporations worry that they will suffer. Uh, HSBC has its main investments. Uh, that's the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank, uh, which is also a US bank and a British bank. And actually, its home is Britain. But it's uh, by its name, as its name would suggest, uh, most of its business is in China and Hong Kong. And so while it was uh, not willing to embrace this national security law initially, it's now fully on board. Hmm. You know, um, uh, what did I hear that uh, the UK was willing to take some enormous number of people if necessary? who wanted to leave Hong Kong, which was, which was why the autonomy was granted before, as I recall. In other words, not to have everybody leave Hong Kong, uh, you know, and worried about the oppression from China. But now the UK has restated that. What's happening? Yeah, this has actually turned out to be the biggest uh, plank in the whole resistance. Uh, the, there's something in Hong Kong called a BNO passport, a British National Overseas Passport. Uh, when the UK uh, handed over Hong Kong, it allowed, I think, around 200,000 actual British passports, but said it couldn't do that for what was then about 6 million people. Uh, and so that it rather would give those other rest of those people a British overseas passport, which would be a travel document that allows them to uh, enter countries without a visa and so on but it only allows them to go to Britain for, without a visa for up to six months. And so what uh, Boris uh, has done is he's suddenly declared to our surprise that those BNO passport holders would then now be given a chance to go for a year. And instead of just being in Britain, they could actually work there. And if they qualified, they could get a permanent British passport. So a lot of Hong Kong people hadn't taken the BNO very seriously. To qualify for it, you had to have been born at the handover in 1997. So even a lot of the youngsters who are in their lower 20s would qualify if they were born before July 1st, 1997. 
my daughter was born there a year later, so she wouldn't qualify, but she also has a U.S. passport, so that's not a problem. Mm. But a lot of her friends and of people she knows do qualify. And right now, only 300,000 people hold those passports, but uh, what's happening now is they're all looking around and figure out how you get online. What do you do to, to get the BNO? Uh, and the number of people who qualify by virtue of being born Chinese uh, nationals, Chinese people born in Hong Kong before 1997 uh, is, is uh, there's like 2.9 million of them that qualify for that. Now, this raises a big question for the US because a lot of people are saying, okay, that gets us uh, most of the grown-ups, but of course, most of the protesters in Hong Kong are younger than that. Uh, and so the question becomes, what kind of further uh, moves might the U.S. make? We know that Trump has signaled, and, and the State Department under the new uh, Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act has uh, indicated that Hong Kong does not have genuine autonomy. Under that act, the, the Secretary of State was, is and was required to indicate every year whether that autonomy that's promised Hong Kong is maintained. And because of this British, uh, uh, excuse me, Chinese national security laws being proposed and a lot of other shenanigans that have occurred over the past year, he said he could not certify that Hong Kong had that autonomy. And everyone agrees with that. I mean, it, it's pretty much it would have been impossible for him to certify that level of autonomy that was promised in the basic law, given all of the interference that China has had in Hong Kong. So he, he made he did his part, and that opened the door for the president to issue a, a some kind of decision as to what kind of sanction or what kind of action will be taken. And the president has signaled that uh, the United States uh, will likely no longer recognize Hong Kong's special status, which would be uh, kind of catastrophic for Hong Kong as such, because that, that special status given Hong Kong, uh, and it's, it's given at the, at the benefit of these countries that are willing to do it. China has asked the United States, the UK and others, Canada and so on, uh, to treat Hong Kong specially and not treat it the same as China. So in a way, China's complaining about foreign interference, but it has very little leg to stand on because it's actually asked these countries to treat Hong Kong separately from China based on the high degree of autonomy. So that certainly gives them a legitimate right to do that. So Trump has signaled, to make a long story short, he's signaled, yes, this, uh, uh, the US is going to withdraw this recognition of special status, but he hasn't quite said exactly what's going to happen. And the new Human Rights and Democracy Act, which passed in Washington this past year during the protest, uh, gives him a number of tools. He could just target individual officials, or he could withdraw completely that status, or he could withdraw it in certain areas and so on. And he hasn't told us what he's going to do yet. At the same time, and I'm sorry for the long-winded story, it's okay. it's but at okay. the same time, uh, the National People's Congress issued this resolution calling on its standing committee to issue a law uh, uh, on national security and that this law will be promulgated directly in Hong Kong. And that law is to regulate sedition, subversion, and terrorism, and uh, even foreign interference in Hong Kong. So this idea that a national law would be applied directly in Hong Kong still is also up in the air because the standing committee has to issue the final text. The NPC, the National People's Congress ruling, uh, specified that this law was designed to prevent, stop, and punish threats to national security and terrorism and all this stuff. So, and I can say as a footnote here, the Hong Kong police have started labeling the protesters as terrorists. So they're trying to fit them in the box of, of Beijing's new national security law. Meanwhile, all these officials in Hong Kong are declaring how wonderful this law will be and how much it is needed. Uh, and uh, they're saying, oh, it's gonna be a narrow law that will only affect people who are advocating independence and so on. But no one in Hong Kong really believes that because they know that China's approach to national security has never been gentle and friendly and narrow, but very broad. 
And so this is where Hong Kong is right now. What will be in this new national security law and what will be in the US response? And then what will the allies, they've also, there's a joint statement by Canada, Australia, the UK and the United States. What will they do themselves? So far we got Boris Johnson's uh, you know, BNO passport holders will, will be able to go to the UK. Well, I, you know, I, it, it does sound like an inflection point. It sounds like Johnson, however motivated, well, whether by altruism or mm, he wants the human capital to come, whatever. Um, it sounds like if I were, if I had the ability um, to upgrade my my travel documents that way, I would do it. Because I, and I think a lot of people will do it and, and that'll leave only the younger people there uh, and then things will be tough. And, and I think that security law, which I think China can make that happen, so who's gonna stand in the way, um, that security law is gonna result in a lot of retraining, uh, yeah. removal and retraining into the mainland, into places like Masangia, uh, where, where you get to training during the day and torture at night and, and you, get, you get retrained over time. And the same thing with those executives you were talking about, who worry more than about their company, they worry about them themselves. They worry about be, being retrained themselves. If I were in Hong Kong now, I'd be really, I'd be really concerned and anxious about the future because nobody, there's no white knight going to come in and save them. Right. It, gonna, yeah. Yeah. And of course, this is a dilemma for uh, U.S. policymakers in, in Washington. Uh, <clears throat> what can you do? I mean, generally, the idea is, of course, by this Human Rights and Democracy Act, which, which was a, an amendment to a long existing law called the Hong Kong Policy Act. And so what can you actually do to sort of uh, leverage Beijing into, uh, you know, pulling back from this and not going so far? Now, as far as I know, there's not any behind the scenes efforts to sort of calm things down. You have to see this also in the broader context that, that the U.S. has a trade war going on with China and uh, the, the relationship between China and the United States. I mean, Trump liked to say he can, uh, you know, reach deals. He's the deal maker with everybody. But this guy is a, a deal making disaster in some ways because we know North Korea is also going crazy today, uh, telling, uh, you know, that he's no longer going to talk to South Korea. So his love affair, as he used the term, with Kim Jong-un is also a bit in trouble. Uh, and the, at the same time, his relationship with Beijing and this trade war is a problem. And for Hong Kong, there's a little bit of uncertainty as well as to whether Hong Kong is just a pawn in all of this and what will happen. I will say that most of the Democratic camp is happy to see the United States step up because they see no alternatives. They, they have gone to the streets in the millions. They've done everything from uh, nonviolence to violence. They've done it all and none of it works uh, that it's not heard either by their Hong Kong officials or by Beijing. So, so this is a problem. And, and the US then has this big global relationship with China and the rest of the world is standing by at this inflection point because we know that this is like the Cold War. It's a struggle between authoritarianism and democracy. And right now, democracy is not doing so well because the leadership uh, in Washington and actually in London as well is not the kind of leadership that uh, we've, we would hope. We haven't, uh, we haven't helped them. We haven't stepped up, um, you know, even with, even with the bully pulpit. We yeah. haven't, you know, tried to cool it off. We haven't tried to talk to Xi Jinping and, and stop it. And that's consistent, isn't it, with uh, American policy over the past few years. Um, things happen. We don't say anything. Uh, we don't use any tools. We only do this kind of tariff war thing and, and well, the war, yeah. war of blame. But we, we don't actually try to uh, affect their conduct as it regards other territories, like the South China Sea, the East China Sea. All that is we have no influence on those things. Well, yeah, the trick is and, and where I stand, because I deal a lot also in South Asia, and India and, and East Asia as well, is that the U.S. has policies on these things. And in the trade war, you know, there was actually a lot of support for getting tougher on China because it didn't seem like the, the go, go softly approach was working. But to make uh, even a tougher 
uh, approach worked, you need diplomacy. And what we found is that in the current administration that they've cut off most of those avenues, they abandoned TPP almost, you know, the, the trade agreement almost from day one. And that, that would have been a very good vehicle uh, to uh, get allies together to have a united policy in dealing with China. So then the, the way they're acting now over Hong Kong uh, is also problematic because there's no diplomacy uh, with our allies. The Europeans are, are like the deer in the headlight. They don't know quite what to do. So China is very adept at using united front tactics to divide and conquer in Europe, rewarding the countries that they go along to get along and punishing those who don't. So, so uh, this kind of leadership seems to be missing. Uh, I don't like to see the US bullying the rest of the world, but I think the US has basically inherited a position of leadership in the world. And right now, uh, this America first approach hasn't been delivering what, yeah. what the, those- uh, no, but, it, but it does suggest that, um, you know, uh, when, when the, when the, what is it, the, when, the, when, when the chickens are away, the fox will play or whatever the old slogan is. Uh, yeah. I think Xi Jinping sees that Trump is a paper tiger. He sees he doesn't, that Trump doesn't follow through, that Trump doesn't really do diplomacy, doesn't even speak on the subject. He has no consistent policy. And Xi Jinping says, okay, this is a great opportunity for me. I'm going to do what I wanted to do before. I'm going to take over. I'm going to cut the autonomy. I'm going to I'm going to move uh, 2047 till right now. I'm going to control this place. And, and that'll be good for me because it'll show the people in China I'm really in charge. Uh, it'll show the people in Xinjiang I'm really in charge. And I will use all these things because nobody is going to stop me. Nobody. Not Europe, not anybody in Asia, not the United States. And so this is his moment, isn't it? And, uh, you know, and I suggest that, that he is more emboldened all the time. Uh, because if you get away with something, then you, you know, make another target to try to get away with that. Yeah, I think one of the things about, I think you're right. I think the thing about China is you can actually get tough on China. In some ways, they respect that. They expect if you have an interest that's contrary to theirs, that you're going to step up and, and take care of it. But if you do that in a way that's ineffectual, or you feign that you're not doing that, you know, your buddies and backslapping, uh, then uh, they, they're not children. They know how to deal with diplomacy. They know how to take care of their business and, and they, they will do so. And I, I think even in the prior administration, I think Obama, when he first uh, took office, he had in his character, he had the idea that I didn't want the United States to be a bully, that I'll be nice to China and uh, you know, would be more respectful. And I think they took advantage of that and he quickly learned uh, and unleashed Hillary Clinton on them <laughs> to, to be tougher. Uh, that, that, that basically, if you want to succeed in a relationship with China, you have to identify what your goals are and work with your allies, engage in diplomacy, and stand tough when you need to. And that's what they expect from you. I mean, they're always quoting their ancient for these strategies and, and that they expect it from you. Uh, if the, there's a sign that you don't know what you're doing, that, that they're going to take advantage of it. Yeah, move right in. Now, what about what about uh, Taiwan? <clears throat> you know, there's a similar issue about control in Taiwan and the future of um, I don't know if autonomy is the right word, but maybe it is. Uh, in the autonomy of Taiwan, when China wants it, and China is making all efforts it can, but it's not nearly as successful because Taiwan is a, is a democracy in in a much truer sense. So what, what's happening there and how does this play with Hong Kong? Well, this plays hugely with Hong Kong. The thing that we know from opinion polls that prior to the recent election, Tsai Ing-wen was actually going to lose. And then the, the Kuomintang, the Nationalist Party, was set to win. Uh, but what happened is Hong Kong. And uh, when everybody in Taiwan saw what Beijing was doing in Hong Kong, was happening in Hong Kong, the political tide shifted dramatically. So one of the things that's been true for years, and it, pretty much every time uh, the, the DPP has won in Taiwan, it's been because of Beijing shenanigans, either, either putting more missiles in place or whatever, 
threatening Taiwan. So whatever they want to happen in Taiwan, usually they manage to orchestrate the opposite happening. <laughs> she won in a landslide uh, and she's even now part of the story in Hong Kong offering some, uh, I haven't followed the latest statements on it, but it's some kind of asylum options for Hong Kong activists. Uh, and so one of the expectations is that some Hong Kongers will be moving to Taiwan if the situation gets really bad in Hong Kong. And, and with this national security law, the risk of, of Beijing overreaching increases exponentially. So this, this is where it's at. And Taiwan, uh, it, as it moves away from Beijing and there's even pressure there to declare openly independence, then the threat of war uh, gets serious. Uh, and uh, I don't know if the current US administration is up to the task of handling uh, a race crisis in America, a pandemic and a war in, tai in the Taiwan Straits. So let's hope things stay under control. It's, it's even optimistic to think of that possibility. Uh, <laughs> You know, in the meantime, our relationship with China on, on whatever's left is deteriorating with the, the blame game going go both ways. And uh, the tariff, certainly the war is not over. And uh, he's, uh, Trump is, uh, is, pushing, is pushing Chinese students out of the country. The Chinese are closing the border against Americans. It's not a time you want to go there and, and uh, try to get a job as it was clearly the time 20 years ago. Go to China, get a job, make a career. You'll you'll make money. You, you'll find friends. You'll drink beer on the on, in the uh, sidewalk cafes. I don't think it's like that anymore, is it? Yeah, it's it's become tough, and I, and I think uh, young people may be more worried about doing this. I know the Chinese, as you know, the Chinese students are the largest uh, group of. Uh, foreign students in the US. I, I forget the three, 300 and some odd thousand. Yeah. Some thousand, yeah. Uh, and uh, Beijing also uses its tactics in the US. And some of their tactics have become more famous in Australia, uh, where they've tried to influence university policies and get students expelled who protest against China and so on. But in the US, there's these uh, organizations like the Chinese Students and Scholar Association and the consulates uh, and so on have influence. In fact, I've heard that the largest group of CSA members is in the University of Hawaii, actually. So there, there's big mem the membership there. And, and it's been said, uh, told to me, and I haven't directly researched it, that the actual head of that association on the West Coast in Hawaii is literally picked by the consul, Jim Beijing's consul general in, in, in San Francisco. So the China uses its, its uh, skills uh, to uh, mobilize students and get protests going and so on. Uh, now recently, uh, during the episodes last year, I was uh, on a speaker panel with Joshua Wong and others at Columbia University. And it was interesting to see that uh, the police were all around the building where we were gonna have this session. And uh, the queues to get in were so long that not even half the people could get in. And then there were students standing up to sing China's national anthem in the middle of it and everything. And this is at a university where the, the, the university had abolished the CSSA uh, on campus. <laughs> so it's, it's the, the, this is something that's known. And then of course you get into the big fight about Chinese scholars who study engineering and chemistry and stuff. Uh, whether they're going to get visas to the United States. So, you know, our campuses are aflame with all these disputes uh, between China and the United States. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I heard that the Confucius Society um, was strong in Canada. Canada closed them all down. Um, yeah. I, I don't know where the Confucius Society is right now here in the U.S., but <laughs> it's nice to say there's a lot of contention, and it's part of an unraveling, it looks like to me, of the relationship that was pretty sweet uh, 15 or 20 years ago. And we were all in the same boat working together for a better economy, better trade relations, and trying to teach the Chinese. Uh, I, I, use, I don't mean that in a, in a negative way, but trying to bring them along and show them all our stuff so that we could be partners. 
Um, they may have seen it more as an opportunity than, than, than an equality, but <clears throat> suffice to say, that's gone. Uh, and I, I worry about it being part of a historical, historical drift toward uh, hostile relations and even war. Yeah, I think there is a danger and the, the regime in, in Beijing is, we are fond of saying, has a, a, a kind of legitimacy we call performance legitimacy. So that uh, while the US government, for all of its ills, uh, has a democratic form of legitimacy because it's actually elected, uh, in China that's not the case. And, and so what will a regime do when the economy is collapsing or they, they have problems? They of course had a coronavirus and it's become also part of the information war. Uh, and so we know that they, they, the virus first showed its head in China, Wuhan, and assuming uh, that was the cause of it, the source of it, then China has got into a big propaganda campaign uh, to show how well they've handled it in comparison to uh, the United States, which has the highest numbers of cases. So this 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 conflict is multi-directional. It involves uh, trade and aid. It involves technology. It involves outreach to other countries and who's going to be friends and who's not. It involves the South China Sea. Now it involves Hong Kong, uh, and in some ways, Hong Kong is like the front line of this. And the situation is is rather dire at the moment. I think it's more than just U.S. trade interests. I think everybody in the world admires Hong Kong. It's just one of the most admired cities on earth. And so to see it put through this this turmoil and and this threat, I think uh, bothers us all. Of course, in Hawaii, we we worry more about it because we have so many people whose uh, roots and whose family ties and stuff are there. Because uh, most of the Chinese that originally came to Hawaii came from the southern part of China and Guangdong and so on. So Hawaii's connection, I think, is especially important. Well, you know, <clears throat> there's, a, there's an operatic tragedy here, a Shakespearean kind of tragedy, because you know that it never, never goes back. History never moves back. Yeah. It always moves forward. And, um, you know, if you say, well, there are only a limited number of mm, logical options uh, for the way this is going to go. One of them is, of course, that somehow Xi Jinping relents for some reason. I, I can't imagine that reason right now. And he gets kinder and gentler. Uh, they go back to some level of autonomy or at least stability. Um, the other option is that he, he becomes more uh, repressive. And that, that really does seem like the likely possibility, given the fact that nobody is standing in the way. And it serves his interest to do that, um, you know, in very, not only in Hong Kong, but other places, other, you know, including Europe. It's going to look good for him to control the situation in Europe. Um, so I see that as the other major fork in the road here. And I suggest to you, that's probably where this is going to go. Isn't it? Yeah, it's very difficult and 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 very risky at the moment. <clears throat> I can say one of the things that has been a pet peeve of mine is that Hong Kong itself, uh, we the government in Hong Kong and the corporate elite in Hong Kong, in some ways in this autonomy model, were charged with an intermediary role uh, that they could maybe soften Beijing's attitude towards Hong Kong by representations they could make in the interest of Hong Kong. And I think this has been one, in fact, I've be honest with you, I've written an op-ed that I'll probably send to you in a day or so uh, on this, that one of the big deficiencies is uh, they're not representing Hong Kong well. Uh, it seems that they, they're in the game to stay in the game and saying what Beijing wants and doing what Beijing wants is, is in their view more rewarding than representing Hong Kong's core concerns to Beijing and trying to mediate and moderate uh, Beijing's approach to Hong Kong. Uh, their approach is very much in the authoritarian, hardline authoritarian playbook. Now, we do have wiggle room at the moment, but I'm not optimistic that it will be taken advantage of. And that is because this national security law has not been uh, finalized yet. So that would leave room. I mean, there are very concrete issues on the table. Uh, this law 
is, you know, in Hong Kong, like in the United States, the, the Court of Final Appeal and all the courts can exercise review over laws. So if a law is passed that violates your free speech and you're arrested, you can bring that up in court and the court can exercise what we call constitutional judicial review and decide whether that law violates uh, the guarantees in the constitution or in the Hong Kong case in the basic law. And the courts in Hong Kong do this all the time. So this is one of the great things about Hong Kong. It really has the rule of law, at least up until now. And the courts can do that. But what are the courts going to do with a mainland law that's suddenly injected into Hong Kong? Are they going to be able to declare some part of that mainland law to be in violation of the rights guarantees in the, the chapter on rights in the basic law? Uh, that's very doubtful. Uh, my guess is Beijing will probably, even when they issue it, will declare it conforms to the basic law. So if you take, this is a very practical consideration because the, the, the heart of the Hong Kong difference is the rule of law. And the, the protection of the rule of law is the very basis for wanting Hong Kong to have autonomy so mm -hmm. that Beijing can't interfere. And the basic law is full of language saying, that mainland departments shall not interfere in Hong Kong, that Hong Kong shall pass national security laws on its own. It says that literally on its own, and I'm quoting, all these things designed to keep Beijing's, uh, this two systems, that system from interfering in Hong Kong. And at the heart of it is this power in the courts. And quite frankly, because Beijing has monopolized the, the government and has ways that it monopolizes the legislature, it has been the courts and the people that have been able to guard Hong Kong's autonomy. The courts do it in the courthouse and the people do it on the street. Mm. And, and so for them to do it on the street, their rights need to be protected from overreaching national security laws and secrecy laws and public order laws and so on. And the courts are the ones that do that. So this is at the core of how this thing works. And now what do you do? What will the courts do with this new national security law if its language is vague and overreaching? And in, in the NPC ruling, they, which is going to be part of this law, it declares that mainland agencies on national security will be set up in Hong Kong. Now, if these officials now behind the scenes are allegedly going to supervise the police in investigations, if they behave in a way that violates basic rights of protesters and whoever, uh, professors perhaps, journalists, if they are behind the scenes doing things that violate rights, will the court be willing to declare their actions, not just the, the law itself, but their actions in violation of the Bill of Rights in Hong Kong? Mm, and, maybe in the short term, but not in the, not in the intermediate right. or the long term. Uh, no. uh, what I get out of this, actually, Michael, is that is that the there's a group of business guys, bankers, financiers, international, but you know Chinese living living in Hong Kong to invest money into mainland China, and no. they make a huge amount of money, and they've been compromised. I think the Chinese government, Xi Jinping, um, and his representatives have somehow compromised them with the notion that they can continue to do this. They can continue to be the funding source and make all the money as long as they don't get in the way of Beijing's uh, attempt to, you know, repress the young democratic contingent in Hong Kong. And, and I suggest that over time, what's going to happen is um, Beijing will repress that group. Um, and the fellows who are compromised will continue to make at least some money and autonomy will be lost. In other words, the democratic street people are going to be thrown under the bus in favor of some money and power. Yeah, and, and, and this is more than it seems on its face, because once you put in place a system where Beijing officials can determine who are winners and losers in Hong Kong's economy by you either sign on and declare you want this national security law or your toast, once they have the power to declare winners and losers, then what used to be rated every year as the freest economy in the world uh, will no longer be the freest economy. It will start looking like the mainland economy with official fingerprints all over who wins and who loses. And of course, in that world, speaking out 
uh, would be at your own peril. Yes. Now, it sounds like small potatoes because, of course, the Hong Kong economy used to be 20% of China's. Now it's about 3%. Really? Don't, don't imagine that that is what it seems. Nothing is what it seems when it comes to Hong Kong. Because <laughs> most of the foreign investment, something like 70% of China's overseas investment into China passes through Hong Kong because it has the rule of law. And pretty much all of the, uh, the, the red capitalists in China set up in Hong Kong so that they can participate in the global trade regime without having interference from, from Beijing. So while the overall ec economic, you know, the, the economy may be a smaller portion, it is a very important portion. So one of the things that's stunning here is it looks like Xi Jinping is willing to sacrifice it in order to maintain a CCP control. Yeah. So this is what's happening. Well, I have one more question for you, Michael, before we have to go. And that is, you know, you spent a um, good part of your career in Hong Kong. And really? maybe, maybe some would say those are the best days in Hong Kong. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, there are always people who are looking for or should be people in the United States were looking for adventure. I think there are fewer of them these days now, and not just because of COVID, because of many things. But would you ever go back? Would you ever go back to live there, work there, teach there, write there, do business there? I, I definitely would if, if I wasn't going to be arrested. Uh, <laughs> That's what I mean. <laughs> I mean, I, Hong Kong is, is an exciting place. And I do know and have friends who are young professors who are there. They're Americans and they, they're in the middle of all of this. Uh, they don't know quite how to deal with it. I, I was there at the, at the get-go, so I kind of got in on the, uh, the first day and uh, have a status as a public intellectual, which perhaps allows me to say and do things that I uh, would do at my peril. Uh, maybe not getting tenure or not getting promoted or all these other things that young scholars worry about. But, uh, and, and those tools have been around for a long time. Uh, but uh, it's an exciting place to work. Uh, and I hope uh, China doesn't ruin it. But, but I think uh, if, if it becomes a place, just speaking now, not of human rights lawyers like myself, but of business lawyers or, or businessmen or, or other sorts of people, uh, then I, I think if it becomes a place where China is picking winners or losers, then I think there may be a, a lot of uh, business move out of Hong Kong. Uh, they become wary of. We know people invest in China because they make money, uh, but what is you know the tipping point where it no longer is a viable or a safe? Because basically businessmen are looking at political risk, mm -hmm. and so. That's the question. But uh, otherwise, working in Hong Kong and with Hong Kong people is as good as it gets. Well, it sounds like there's a lot of this uh, tilts on, on, the, on the United States. Uh, if we had uh, a working State Department with policies and implementation, if we had um, you know, uh, uh, executives uh, in our government who could fashion real engagement with them, the, the future of Hong Kong, it seems to me, would change, would, would improve. Maybe that'll happen. Yeah, it's hard to say. The trick is, is someone who, who can calibrate uh, how to be firm and still at the same time uh, do diplomacy and the work that needs to be done to conduct a relationship. Yeah. And, uh, but I, I hope it doesn't mean uh, someone who would just give, it, give Hong Kong away in order to do a deal. Uh, Hong Kong doesn't deserve that. Uh, thank you, Michael. Michael Davis, it's so good to talk to you. I hope we can catch up again, and I'm sure there'll be plenty to talk about next time, too. Very good. I look forward to it, Jay. Maybe one, one time I'll eventually get myself over there to do it. That's what I've been looking forward to. Okay. In the meantime, wash your hands and wear a mask, okay? Doing it. <laughs>